everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Language Lounge. And my name is Michelle Ola. And today I have Joe Dale here with me again, which I am so excited. I looked to see when it was you were on the podcast earlier and it was like episode 14. And I think we just did 50 now. So I just hit episode 50. So that was a long time ago in podcast episodes. So <laughs> I'm so excited to have um, Joe Dale here. He is a modern foreign language and technology guru, in my opinion. Um, and so one of the things I've been playing around with is chat GPT, as a lot of other teachers are kind of experiencing this. In the last month, I've been kind of nerding out on this. And when I thought um, I wanted to talk to somebody, there is nobody else I wanted to talk to besides you, Joe. This is going to be so much fun. I can't wait to hear all of the things um, that chat GPT can kind of do for teachers. So welcome. Thanks for coming on the show. What have you been up to lately? Oh, well, first of all, it's my absolute pleasure. I mean, the fact that um, I'm, I've been asked to come on for the second time. Is there anyone else that you've asked to come on twice? I think so only one person has come on twice. I'm thinking of who that was, though. Maybe Tim Egan, but not very many people have. But I've had so okay. many great people on that I guess we might start repeating. And you're the first to set the trend. So thanks well, again. Well, first of all, <laughs> First of all, thank you for the opportunity. And I must say, um, hand on heart, I think it's a brilliant podcast that you're doing. So thank many you. really interesting people um, who I who I follow on Twitter and the fact you can then hear their voices. It's just it's just uh, fabulous. So, um, yeah, I've been um, talking at podcasts. I've been uh, making my uh, my own podcast or producing a podcast, should I say, for the uh, the post primary languages island um, organization. Um, and they are government funded in the south of uh, Ireland and we've just uh, put out two episodes of a brand new podcast called MFL, MFL standing for Modern Foreign Languages, MFL Teachers Talk and it's available on Spotify and on Apple. It went live on Apple a couple of days ago um, and it's also available on the ppli.ie website as well. So I produce it, I'm not the host, I don't appear on it but I produce it and um, awesome. it's a lot of fun and we've um, we're going to have a, a, an episode every month. That's the idea. So uh, that's Great. one thing I've been doing. And I've been also um, commissioned to make a couple of pilot podcasts as well, as well as running um, some uh, podcast masterclasses with people from around yes. the world, which has, been, which has been really cool as well, um, as well as going to uh, Dublin on a regular basis um, I've been doing face-to-face -face training courses with um, uh, mostly English teachers, but also teachers from across the curriculum from around Europe. Um, and these are Erasmus Plus funded courses. And um, it's just amazing now that because of Brexit, it's now mm. not easy for me to you know jump on a plane and go to um, work in, in countries in mainland Europe, um, in the EU. But I can go to Dublin. I can go to Ireland and work. So that's absolutely fabulous. So that's great. I'm getting out of the house a little bit now. <laughs> that's <is> awesome. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but another reason I wanted to get into more into podcasting is because it is something I can do from home um, yeah. and earn a living at the same time. But yeah, ChatGPT. I've been obsessed <laughs> by ChatGPT, as I think lots of other people in, interested in, in ed tech. And I've been, you know, watching videos, reading tweets. Um, I even actually. I even um, attended on Thursday last week um, an event called Indie Pod Summit, which mm -hmm. is designed to um, attract uh, independent podcasters all together to share tips and tricks about uh, how to produce good podcasts. And one of the tips that I got there was to use a tool called Podchaser, which mm -hmm. is a uh, like a search tool, I suppose, for podcasts because um, there's a big issue around uh, discoverability. And one of the things that you can do, very similar to Google Alerts, um, you can put in a keyword and it will then send you um, emails every few days uh, listing the podcasts that have uh, featured your keyword. So, of course, oh, that's so cool. my keyword was ChatGPT. So <laughs> today I had um, an email saying there were 108 podcasts that mentioned ChatGPT, wow. uh, some of which are in different languages as well. So uh, that's really cool as well if you are a fluent, I don't know, German speaker, for example, you might want to hear about ChatGPT in German. And then a few days before that, I had another one with 100 uh, podcast episodes, different podcast episodes about ChatGPT. So it's absolutely on fire yeah. at the moment. Um, and yeah, I mean, for example, one of the 
one of the standout um, events that I've attended recently. I've been attending a few webinars ar around ChatGPT, but one that um, I absolutely love, which blew my mind, which I think you saw as well, was with um, Claudia Elliott mm -hmm. and Meredith White. Uh, and what I loved about it was um, Meredith was was aware of what you could do, some of the things you could do with ChatGPT, but Claudia was literally showing her live the way that you could, for example, say, uh, write a text uh, aimed at a, um, uh, uh, in Spanish, aimed at um, a certain age of student, uh, write the title, write the, uh, the text, write the comprehension questions, write the answer key. And Meredith's natural face was just, <laughs> Um, her reaction was just golden. It was just like, what? It does that? It does that? Yeah. You're kidding me now. You're kidding me. Come on. You know. I think so, that's just it. Like, I think a lot yeah. of people are hearing it, but maybe a lot of teachers, and it's not just education. It's like everywhere. All the, you know, the business, yeah. the business pages, LinkedIn, everywhere is talking about this. Um, but I think maybe not everybody has a really clear understanding. Like you hear it, but like, what is this anyways, other than like us really early adopters that, you know, hop on all of these things that are like coming up. But for, for the listener that has heard chat GPT, you know, what is it like in a very simplistic, maybe we should ask chat GPT what it is, which is a fun little thing too, but what is it? How would you explain it to other teachers? What is it? What okay. is its potential? You know, what have you seen? Okay, so essentially, ChatGPT, it's an AI bot, but it's uh, completely different from other uh, AI bots, or certainly it's at the cutting edge of mm -hmm. this technology because uh, you can have a more sort of natural conversation with it. So in the past, when people have used bots for, let's say, customer service, uh, it can get uh, pretty clunk clunky pretty quickly. Um, but what's people really like about ChatGPT, it's a little bit like a Google search, but much, much, it feels much, much more personalized. So for example, in a language learning context, you can have a conversation with it in Spanish, French, German, what have you. So some people have described it as a type of sort of, you know, learning assistant, as mm -hmm. it were, but because it's, uh, it's based on um, a language model, that's what it says. If you go to um, the OpenAI website, um, it can remember the things that it's already said within uh, a chat. So you can ask a question or a prompt as one, as one says, um, I'm always, you know, very up with the lingo. Um, <laughs> so you put your prompt in and it will then give you an answer and then you can say, Oh, can you do that again? Or can you change that? Can you aim it at a, um, someone with, um, more basic French, for example, can you differentiate, can you create three versions of this text? One for, uh, learners that have been uh, not learning as long, one for, say, intermediate learners, one for more advanced learners. I've tried all of these things out mm -hmm. personally, and it's it's amazing. I mean, you do have to tweak things, and you do have to take uh, some things that it does with a pinch of salt. For example, I'm really into music, and I said, uh, that, you know, this band called uh, Mega City 4 that I really liked in the late 80s, early 90s. And I said, uh, tell me about Mega City 4. And they said, you know, they started saying about where they were from and everything. I said, you know, tell me about the discography. So they listed about eight albums, two of which were, were correct and the others were completely made up. Yeah. So that is <laughs> something so to, that we have, know. I have heard that there, um, when I was doing something and, you know, one of the reasons, one of the ways that I found it very helpful is with education and with second language acquisition, we have a lot of research and a lot of very deep kind of headed dodgy going on. And sometimes it's like wading through, like, what does this actually mean? Right. So I did put a, you know, a topic in there. It was like second language um, acquisition and motivation. It gave me some research. And then I said, cite the source and it did the, it just made something up. And so you do have to be very careful, like with everything, right. Especially everything on the internet, you do want to be careful that, you know, you, you, double check things and, you know, check your sources and don't believe everything it says. Um, you know, so there are some disclaimers and they have, uh, you know, some of these things right on chat GPT website and stuff. Um, so there are some downsides, uh, but I do think, and I think we can talk about some of the other maybe downsides of it later, but I'm very excited just about the possibilities of what it can do to assist teachers and to really help teachers. Teachers, it's a workload, man. There is a lot of stuff that teachers yeah. are expected to do from 
lesson planning and unit planning and activities and just paperwork and differentiation and all of the things. And so to me, the potential of how this can help, like, as, like you said, like as a research, as an assistant, essentially another person, and it does feel like a person. That's what is so crazy to me. <laughs> um, I sit at home by myself. I work from home. And sometimes I just get a block. I know I want to do something, but I don't have anybody to really talk with or bounce ideas from. And it really can be. So one of the things that they list as a way to use it is with just idea generation, right? And I found that that's one thing for me that has been really just interesting. Like I don't necessarily take exactly what it says, but it helps me go down another path. And then I'm like, oh, let's explore that. And let's explore that. And it can follow my crazy trains of thought, right? And kind of keep tweaking and adding and doing all of those things. So there's a lot of really interesting potential. Um, you mentioned some of them and I loved, so maybe we can talk more about like for differentiation, because I think that was when you kind of mentioned with languages. So what have you seen yeah. with that and playing around with how you can take a text or, and differentiate it by language? Absolutely. Before I go into that, I just wanted to echo what you said and what I particularly liked, uh, one of the things I particularly liked about um, Claudia and um, Meredith's conversation was the way in which they were saying that if uh, ChatGPT can do those sorts of very um, uh, mechanical tasks of, you know, uh, yeah. creating text, maybe as a skeleton, as a starting point, as opposed to just taking the text as it is and, and you being able to adapt it, but just uh, that fear of the blank page, being able to just create something there and then um, with uh, a text which is aimed at a certain age of student uh, using certain words you can put mm -hmm. in keywords that you want it to include um, having the uh, comprehension questions coming up having an answer key those sorts of things are doing uh, the heavy lifting mm -hmm. if you like and reduces the cognitive overload for teachers because te as you say you know teachers are really really busy and they don't have the the headspace always to uh, take the time to to think about put together these texts these, you know it takes time to search on the internet to find mm -hmm. a text and even if you find it it might be that something that you have to you have to tweak or adapt of course um getting chat gpt to do the heavy lifting to do that initial uh text and with say questions is mm -hmm. wonderful and then you can just tweak it and make it make it your own so i think from the point of view of um giving people more time to think mm -hmm. i think was what claudia uh, was saying and I thought that was really really wonderful um, from a differentiation point of view yeah absolutely so I've um, been playing around with it and I asked it for example uh, write a, a, a daily routine for Mickey Mouse describing uh, how he um, uh, what his morning daily routine is uh, in simple French in more advanced French and then in very advanced French and it was able to do it pretty well I mean I would say in that situation, what happened was they wrote, it wrote, I was going to say they then, I don't know what pronoun they use. Anyway. I guess but, they, um, I guess they would be specific. <laughs> it doesn't feel it wrote, right. Um, I don't know. It wrote the three texts, but then I I went back and I said, can you um, make the, the basic uh, French text simpler? Because yeah. I felt it was more, you know, but of course that's something which um, language teachers can see immediately. They can, they can see whether the, um, uh, maybe the verbs that are being used or if there are different tenses. And of course, you could say, write it all in the present tense or yeah. write it using uh, the perfect tense, whatever it mm -hmm. might be, and that it will cope very well with that. So um, I think from a differentiation point of view, it's great. And also one could argue that it's very good for uh, students to practice independently. But I have to mm -hmm. say as a disclaimer, it does officially say on the on the website that you do have to be 18 or above. So we need to really say that that's mm. that's something which I've mentioned a few times. Um, and so it's something that I think some people are not aware of. And the fact that when you create an account, you have to put in a phone number, you have to put in a mobile mm. phone number. So Good to know. I don't think we should, as educators, should be encouraging students who are below the age of 18 to sign up for an account. But of course, as a teacher um, and someone you know demonstrating um, how EdTech works, then of course you can use it for, say, modeling, or maybe doing some live marking. One feature that I really have liked is the way in which you can uh, put in some text and then ask it for feedback. So you can imagine you could say, take a text that a student has done, 
uh, and then you, as the teacher, put it into ChatGPT live in front of the class, a bit like sort of live marking with a mm-hmm. uh, with a visualizer, and and see what the feedback is. And I think that would be very very powerful. So I think from a an independent learning point of view, and I'm not naive enough to think that students won't use it at home and all the all the bad side of it, which is they're going to try and uh, pass off their work as ChatGPT, uh, sorry, as their own I mean when in fact mm-hmm. it's been made by ChatGPT. But then language teachers have been dealing with Google Translate for right. years and years and years. So this is nothing new. But that said, it's going to be a lot more difficult, I think, to um, identify whether a text has been created in ChatGPT. And I know there are tools out there like, um, uh, is it uh, ChatGPT Zero or Zero ChatGPT, mm-hmm. for example, which um, is supposedly able to identify or, you know, 90% uh, able to identify a text. But there are other tools. I think one's called Quill, which you can then put the text in it. So it will like rewrite it and then it won't be able, you won't be able to distinguish. But anyway, there are lots of tools out there. And I'm sure the students who want to do this sort of thing will do it. And one ingenious thing, which I saw the other day on Facebook, um, was there was um, someone ha- who had been able to uh, hook up the a um a tablet with like a um um a pen and so it was chat gpt's generated text but the this like sort of robotic um pen was literally writing handwriting out on the piece of paper which i just thought was genius but who's going to really do that <laughs> evil genius <laughs> right <laughs> oh yeah but, um, you but know funny, but yeah but yeah but um i just think yeah I mean, what's exciting about it as you know as you were saying earlier in relation to sort of early adopters is you do have all these uh, enthusiastic ed tech fans um, and there were lots and lots in the, in the language teaching community as well who were just sort of, you know, sharing uh, videos. There's a lady called Julia Morris um, uh, from the UK who has made two videos so far, which I'd really recommend uh, people check out. Uh, one's about 30 minutes long and it's particularly saying how it could be used uh, in language learning. And then she's done another really nice one suggesting how it can be used for um, uh, special educational needs students. And mm-hmm. there's ideas around differentiation there as well. That's really cool. There's uh, Steve Morgan as well, who um, has put together like a, a table with different ways in which you can use uh, ChatGPT. Another thing, actually talk, talking of tables, uh, lots of people don't realize, uh, including Meredith, that you can actually ask it to make a table. Wow. So you can ask it to make, um, like, uh, I don't know, say uh, Spanish on the one side and English on the other side, make a table with different vocabulary or turn that into an exercise, but but um, generate it as a table. That's also really cool. So there's, I just think there's so many things that we could we could do with it. But I've, um, because as you can hear from my voice, I'm somewhat passionate about this. So I put together a, a wakelet, which I, knew, which I know I've shared with you, which you um, uh, you, you said before we went on air that um, you've been yes. you know, doing research from this morning and um, it's got about 330 items in it at the moment. So if people don't know Wakelet, it's just a great way to collect links and images and YouTube clips and PDFs. And it works on all devices. So you've got like the app. Um, you can just share to the Wakelet app on um, on your, your phone or your iPad or what have you. But there's also an amazing Chrome extension, which means that you can just click on that, just add it to the same collection. So it's this type of, you know, social bookmarking um, tool. And you can, a bit like Padlet, you can create different formats. You can have it in sort of um, columns or or media. Um, so you get, you know, the thumbnails of everything. Um, I really need to put it into columns, but I need, I need to find some time to organize it a bit. Because it's, it's, it's like, you know, like a filing cabinet. And I've just taken all this paper and I've just dumped it all in. I'll look at it later type thing. <laughs> So I apologize for that, Michelle, when I shared it with you, but I need to put everything in nice columns and say, oh, oh this is, yeah. a, these are videos about ChatGPT. This is, da, 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 this is, you know, and that sort of thing. But, um, but yeah, every, literally every day I've been um, curating content around it, but I hope that by doing so, that will really help uh, people. And, and a few people have been in, in contact with me. Um, someone yesterday, actually, um, uh, from Wellington College, um, who did a, a tilt webinar for us one of the first ones that we did so technology language teaching we did 140 plus um of those uh since the start of the pandemic in fact we've got one literally this evening um which is a uh, very um very fun uh with caroline uh, Sch- uh schlegel and uh aubrey swisher which i just um, had on the podcast like two weeks ago we so they're amazing that's gonna be a great yeah, webinar they're, so they're on at 8 45 our time because they they can't 
uh, get to um, a Zoom until 3.45 after they finish teaching. So that's going to be a bit of a late one for us, but it's going to be uh, it's going to be amazing. And um, yeah, um, this uh, this lady from um, Wellington College, she said, I'm really into ChatGPT. You know, have you got any ideas to uh, to uh, share? And I said, uh, um, of course, uh, Sandra, it's, her name is Sandra Actas. I said, of course, uh, why don't we have a uh, like a stream yard um, conversation? I'm thinking of asking people like Julia Morris, uh, Steve Morgan, who I've mentioned a few other people. Um, uh, Jerome Noges as well has done a really nice um, uh, video. He's done lots of videos on his um, YouTube channel, which is Learn with Jay around uh, EdTech ideas. He's done a really nice one on ChatGPT and probably Helen Myers, who I co-host with on the Tilt webinars. She did a really nice one showing how you can create a text and then put it into, say, immersive reader mm. and get it to read back to you. Those, those sorts of things. So I just love how people are being creative ah. around it and just pushing the envelope on, on how it could be useful in languages in particular, obviously. Oh, I love that. It's And I think from me playing with it, um, you kind of just have to get in, like just jump in and start doing, you know, playing around with things. And I, I think as I went, you get you get better at what to ask, like those what prompts you want to do. You know, so one of the things I found out quickly is when I was asking, you know, so for example, I just, I wanted to kind of put this chain, I'm going to kind of look up here because to me it was fascinating. So I basically just said, create a lesson for students practicing the following vocabulary in a communicative context in Spanish. And I gave them, I went to our curriculum, I gave them the 10 food words, like it included yuca and ajo and, you know, all of these things. And it first gave me like a little comprehensible input sort of strategies. And then it says communicative activity, divide the student into pairs, have them do this, this sort of thing. Then it does an extension, having them, you know, create a menu for a hypothetical food truck with that specializes in Latin American cuisine. And I'm like, you know, nothing like that I'd never heard of, but a lot of things I'm like, oh yeah, I could do that. And then it gave some extension activities. Um, and then it was, I did, okay, so do a short comprehensible input story with some of the above vocabulary with the context of shopping for the food for a recipe. So it gives me something I'm like, oop, re reduce the language in that. So, you know, you know, make it less, you know, simplify. I think that was the prompt I used, simplify the language. So it gives me this, um, you know, person that goes to the shop and is going to buy the food and how much the food costs and, it's in dollars. So then I can ask, I asked it to turn it to pesos. And then we, I can ask it to like, as we're going. Um, and then I'm like, Ooh, write a dialogue between the shopper and the vendor. So then I've got the paragraph and now I've got a pair, you know, a dialogue between the shopper and the vendor. And then I, it, it kind of just sends you down this creative path. And then I'm like, Ooh, well, what are they going to make with us? I'm like, what's a simple recipe in Spanish that uses platanos verdes? And it gives me a recipe. And then I'm like, okay, so now we can start talking about the recipe and make a story about this comprehensible input recipe. And, and then it's like, what are the verbs that are used in that? And then it starts talking about, you know, just all these kind of this path that it can send you down is very creative, in my opinion. Um, and just helps you kind of just generate those ideas and that excitement. Um, and then just very practical things. Do some comprehension questions based on that dialogue that we just had, right? Do them in English, do them in Spanish. And then because it remembers everything, you can like say, I do not like questions one, three, and five, replace those. And it just, so it'll just redo it <laughs> and it'll replace the ones you don't like or, you know, kind of adapt to whatever you tell it to. Absolutely. That's the and key. it's, it's Absolutely. amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. I think that to me was the surprising part of how adaptive it is. And that for me to go through this process on my own and recreating and tweaking and making it better every, you know, iteration for me to do that by myself would take forever or with another person, but it's like instantaneous, you know, so it's, it's definitely um, a fascinating sort of tool. So what are some other ways that you've heard or that you've kind of um, seen it being used or talked about it, especially with languages? Yeah, absolutely. So just when you were saying that, I was thinking, oh, we're, you know, writing a dialogue. Yeah, of course you could use it with uh, something like texting story or, <laughs> Uh, texting story maker so for people who don't know texting story is a ios and android app which allows you to uh, write a conversation and then export it as a video clip 
um, and then you could put it into another uh, video editor uh, and record a voiceover if you wanted to. And then Texting Story Maker is um, not by the same company, but it, it's a similar type of tool, but it works in the browser, which means it will work um, on desktop, on Macs, on, on uh, laptops, as well as on um, iPads as well. So you could uh, get ChatGPT to generate a dialogue, and then you could then put that into um, Texting Story Maker. Uh, which I just think is 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 lovely, and you can do things like um, create your own avatars and put those into uh, the uh, the avatar option within that uh, that tool as well. And then other creative ways I've seen it being used. I saw a really interesting um, uh, video clip by Russell Stannard, who's like an ELT consultant uh, from the UK, and he's got a, an amazing website called Teacher Training Videos and an amazing YouTube channel. And he did about I think it's about a twenty minute video clip. And he shows some different ideas, um, but one of the ideas which I particularly remember is he's a big fan of word wall, and he was showing how you could create a gap fill text, um, and then uh, copy that and put it straight into word wall. Um, I've seen other examples on uh, on Twitter, people talking about um, generating a transcript of a video, mm -hmm. and then asking um, uh, ChatGPT to. Uh, summarize it and create comprehension questions and then put that into Edpuzzle, for example, or um, taking, I was thinking this the other day, actually, I was doing a, um, a webinar around Blookit and mm. um, I was, I haven't tried this yet, but essentially it's like the uh, the term, comma, and then the definition. So this is if you're doing the Quizlet import and I was thinking, I bet I could just say, write me 10 terms with 10 uh, definitions next to them with a comma in between and no spaces. And I haven't tried that, mm -hmm. but I bet it would work. And then yeah. just copy that, put it to block it, and bang, you've got an exercise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's just, just crazy. Yeah, and just the amount of time. Yes, we can do those. Yes, we've been doing those. But if we can save time and energy for teachers, um, because a lot of that time, let's be honest, is outside of their contract time, you know? And, and so that any time, in my opinion, that we can help, reduce that so that teachers have the energy to do what they need to do in their class periods in, in front of their students and have high quality, you know, resources that they can do and, and where make the magic happen. I am all for it, you know, and um, as simple as like that, like you said, the one with the transcripts or taking, you know, some bulk of text and creating you know, and again, the great thing is it, it does, it can be in the target language. So, you know, have the questions. Um, I put in a whole passage um, of a story that I had created, put it in in Spanish and asked for the comprehension questions in English because I wanted to really see how much they knew we can do it. It's not, it can be, you can ask for multiple choice. You can ask for matching. You can have them pull out key vocabulary terms and define them either in English or in the, you know, in the target language. And so the potential there just to, like you said, kind of automate some of the things that do take so much time, um, you know, for teachers, I think is just, you know, the potential is huge. Um, and, I, and I just think it's great for encouraging independence as well. And, you know, feeling not embarrassed to ask a question of ChatGPT because it will just um, give you the answer. I mean, people have talked about bias and what have you, and mm -hmm. I think that is that is an issue um, because obviously it's just as good as the information that's been fed into it. And so there certainly could be examples of bias. Um, but I think from the point of view of encouraging autonomy and independence, I think it's it's fantastic. Now, before we went on air, I know this is a very geeky thing to do, but of course, I put into ChatGPT um, the, the the prompt, and I think there's going to be a real skill with um, developing prompts yeah. as well. Was describe ten ways ChatGPT can be used for language learning for secondary age students. Nice. And it didn't say first of all, well, you have to be over eighteen to use me, but uh, but there we are. So I'll just read these out. If that's okay. Um, so the first one was. Um, to help students expand their vocabulary by providing definitions, synonyms, and antonyms for new words. Okay, next one to practice grammar by. Uh, and I, interestingly, it's um, writing practice with a C, not an S, because obviously <laughs> from, you, from the UK it's going to be with an S. But anyway, not that I'm being picky at all. But um, <laughs> to practice grammar by asking it questions about grammatical structures and rules and receive immediate feedback. Yeah, the immediate feedback thing, mm -hmm. which is something we've known for years about the power of, of ed tech and. Uh, and formative assessment tools, the fact you get yeah. that immediate feedback is really amazing. And this is on a whole different level of immediate feedback. It's just, yeah. I mean, some people have described it as this this idea of, you know, um, uh, Vygotsky's um, uh, uh, one plus mm -hmm. um, one, you know, the, the 
um, the, 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 the person or thing that knows a bit more than you do mm-hmm. about, um, about a particular subject. You could certainly say, in the past, I've said that about Twitter, but why not say about ChatGPT, you yeah. know? Um, so carrying on to practice conversation skills by having students engage in conversations with it on a variety of topics, uh, to practice pronunciation. So this was interesting, to practice pronunciation by having it repeat words and phrases and receive feedback on their pronunciation accuracy. Now, clearly, at the moment, ChatGPT in itself mm-hmm. um, doesn't speak. But one thing that you can do is you can use, let's say, an iPad um, or other other tool to do um, speak selection. So one fun thing that I've been uh, doing at bath time with my my munchkin, who's uh, eight years old now, uh. is I'll say to him, OK, um, give me the names of a couple of characters. So he comes up with very, very silly names normally and I say okay uh, give me a context and he'll say what the context is and I said you want it to be a funny story or a scary story I said oh a funny story dad so then I'll put all that in and we'll come up with some silly names etc and then um, sometimes I read the text to him but sometimes I've used the speak selection just as a joke really because I think it's much better to have the natural authentic voice of course but um, if you use speak selection, it will then read the text back to you. So it could be if you use, let's say, something like immersive reader, mm-hmm. you could put uh, text into immersive reader and have it read back to you because it will recognize the language automatically. And then you're getting that model of pronunciation that based on this uh, this text, which has been generated by ChatGPT. So I think that's another another area. And I think that, yeah, I think the the power of using voice with it, mm-hmm. I think, is it's good, and of it's course, good and when I'm you're, sure it's not far behind. Um, yeah, when you're inputting text into ChatGPT on an iPad, you can just use the dictation. To, you can just mm-hmm. use the microphone and do it straight away. So I think that's that's also uh, really interesting. So let, let's do a few more. Yeah. To help students understand and interpret written t- text by answering questions about the content, to receive suggestions and feedback on their writing, including grammar, vocabulary, and style. See, mm-hmm. to me, that's not cheating. That's just a brilliant idea. So if you've... Uh, and I, I know about the age thing, which I've said yeah. already. I just need to say that as a disclaimer. But yeah, yeah just imagine if you've got a student who's uh, written a text and just wants genuine feedback. They're not asking ChatGPT to create the text. They just want to know where they've gone wrong or or how they can um, improve, which I just think that's that's fair enough. Um, to help students improve their listening skills by having them listen to and respond to audio recordings in the target language. Again, I'm not exactly sure how that refers to ChatGPT unless you use text-to-speech uh, or, I mean, speech selection. Uh, this one's very good to practice giving presentations by presenting to it and receiving feedback on their delivery organization and content so again i suppose you'd have to use the uh the microphone and then dictate into it and then it would yeah um it would then give you feedback but then my understanding is it can't te- it can't like describe your tone or things like that at the moment Yet. but who knows <laughs> right you know, yeah <laughs> um and then finally to help students improve their study skills by providing guidance on note taking memory techniques and exam preparation strategies. So those are just 10 examples. And you can also, you could say, give me another 10. And they'll say, <laughs> yeah, no problem. And he just gives you another 10. So those are just 10, which it it came up with. And these are not just copied from a website, like yeah. 10 ways of using whatever. It's all because it's generative um, language processing. It is uh, essentially... Uh, giving you what it thinks you want to hear that's what I've heard from the the blog posts what have you I've read about it so it's trying to guess from its memory which is huge um, and apparently costs an absolute fortune every day for them to the the computing that you need to process Mm. to actually to run which is why more and more um, it's down when you try to access it (laughs) yeah which already Um, um, my uh, I mean I think right from the beginning they said it's free but it's probably not going to be free. So even I went today and there's GPT plus now that's going to be like $20 a month that bypasses. So when everybody else gets blocked out, you can get in there. Um, But I know it just personally, I hate going to Google now for any sort of like anything. Cause I'm like, well, Google just doesn't understand what I really want. <laughs> you know, GPT GDP really understands <laughs> what I'm looking for. You're they already, just already, spit out some, yeah, they just that spit out a bunch a of stuff. Like, a person, like, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a totally just different interface and experience. Right. And it doesn't, you know, respond to you. I mean, like literally I've typed in things and I've said something and I'm like, let me clarify. That's not what I meant. <laughs> and then I redo mm. it. And then it redoes the prompt based on now what I, 
what I mean. Um, but yeah, so I think there is going to be that that paid version now that we're all getting used to um, used to it. Although they said there's still going to be a free one, but. You know. But then around that, there's an equity issue, isn't there, yeah. in relation to countries that can't afford to pay, let's yeah. say, $20 a month. Is that fair? Is there always going to be a free version? Yeah. Uh, I think that, you know, in I think that's a really important question um, yeah. now. And it's ridiculous, isn't it, that literally it's only been around for a couple of months. And yet we feel like, how can I possibly live without ChatGPT? I know, right? <laughs> it is It is definitely um, It is definitely crazy. It is. Um, I, I do encourage people to at least go on, check it out, try it, um, you know, and see see the possibilities. You know, check out your Wakelet. Um, I know like I did personally, um, have a conversation in Spanish and I said, well, let's have a conversation. Cause again, I work from home now. I don't practice my Spanish. I wasn't speaking. I, yes, I was typing, but you know, I just, he's like, well, he, see, I just call it a, he, I don't know what to call it. You're right. He, she, it, they, um, <laughs> we'll have to discuss that. But, um, I said, you know, do you want, let's have a conversation. And, and it just answered back, like, what would you like to talk about? And I said, well, how about family? And they're like, okay. So then it asked me questions and I answer questions about my family. And then I thought it was interesting because it popped up all of a sudden and said, um, you know, would you like some feedback? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, yes. And so then it gave me some feedback on, you know, some things on what I wrote. And then, you know, it wrote something and I'm, and I'm like, let me check this out. So I said, well, why in your response, when it corrected something I did, I said, well, why did you do this instead of this? And then it gave me a very, you know, a real person sort of feeling of feedback where it said, well, this is why, and you know, the gender of this and it went, is modifying this. And it said, but on the other hand, if you look at it this way, you could have used this, but it, again, it was very natural conversational. You would, you could almost forget that it's not a person on the other end of the line. And I think that's to me, what is so different about it. And so unique as opposed to just using Google Translate and having it correct what I said. That doesn't help me, right? Because I don't understand why it corrected that. And I think that's why when we talk about language learners, there is some value in putting their own work in and again, getting feedback on it of what, you know, what the errors were, or what, you know, again, you know, you're overusing this tense or whatever it might be, you know, you can get some actual feedback on it. Um, and the tone itself is conversational. So I think, you know, we're more likely to accept that feedback um, when it is presented in a very natural language sort of a way. So it's been definitely Absolutely. interesting. And, and when it said, would you like some feedback? Um, in all honesty, how did that make you feel, Michelle? Yeah. Did you have you like know, an emotional reaction to it? You know, it was Or in general, when you're using it, do you sort of think, oh, wow, you've, you know, you've answered my prayers or, oh, wow, yeah. that's a really good response or how does it make you feel emotionally when you're you're working with chat gbt right so for me obviously i was at that i'm at that point where i'm ready for feedback and i like feedback but i thought it was interesting first of all that it asked and if i would have said no then it wouldn't have and i thought wow that is just a lesson for language teachers right because if i'm not ready for it and i'm not ready to hear it you're right it is going to trigger an emotional response i think the other thing is that you know it's a lot less it's a lot easier to take feedback, you know, from this personish like, but not a person, you know, I'm not taking it personally. There's not somebody personally telling me my, my Spanish needs improvement. Right. Um, so I think that part of it, that, that, that filter, that a effective filter is lower for me. At least it was where I'm like, Oh, it's not as impersonal as Google, but it's, but it's also not as personal as your, you know, language instructor or a fellow teacher or a colleague saying something about your language, right? I think it's a very safe place to have that quote conversation, you know, with uh, chat GPT. So um, it's, it's interesting. So it is, it's fantastic. I mean, it makes me think of the film um, called She, I don't know if you've um, heard of it. I've heard it, of it. Yeah. Yeah. Scarlett Johansson, who yeah. basically plays the role of the equivalent of chat GPT, but has her, this like, you know, lovely, gentle voice and what have you. Um, one of the um, one of the bits that really made me think about it with the is it uh, Drucking Phoenix I think is the uh, um, the name of the uh, the act is that right anyway um, that uh, he, she said oh I'm talking to 
250 people at the same time. It might be much higher than that. So in other words, he felt that he was having this one-to-one -one conversation yeah. with her or, right. you know, to use that <laughs> pronoun. But um, because of course it was a, you know, it's a chat bot or it's an, a it's AI. So she was having, I think she said like 250 simultaneous conversations. And then you suddenly think, of course, it's not a real human being. Right. And I think there's, there's more, for me anyway, there's more blurring with uh, the way in which it works. It does feel very natural. It does feel as if you're having a casual conversation with somebody. And I appreciate, you know, that it's not, it's a, it's right. a bot, but I think that, um, that the, those lines are going to become more and more blurred, particularly once you start using voice as it shows in the film. Yeah. Um, and how that will, that will affect uh, the way that we use it in our everyday life. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just, it's absolutely fascinating. I yeah. really can't wait to see how it, um, how it develops and how people use it in creative ways. Um, and uh, I think it's going to change everything actually. I mean, I read one story, uh, it's going to kill Google within two years, which I think is a bit sort of scaremongery, but I think it's going to have a big, uh, big difference. Uh, and I think there's going to be, uh, certainly at this point in the next few months, there's going to be more and more webinars, there's going to be mm -hmm. more and more conference talks. Um, as with anything, it will then, um, you'll be the early adopters who then uh, sort of set out obvious ways in which it can be used, but then there'll always be people that will find out other ways um, as well and then people who maybe are not aware of chat gpt um, at the moment um, might go along to let's say a conference talk and be blown away by 10 ways of using chat gpt and then they'll be yeah. using it um, from then on so it's like with anything i suppose it's like sort of the equivalent of 2005 2006 with blogging and podcasting yeah a number of times you know i would say um oh yeah i'll just put this um this presentation's slideshow on my blog and then he literally hearing people titter and things like that or or when twitter first came out saying oh yeah do you do you tweet you know like do tweet. in um in little corner saying do you tweet and yeah. all this sort of thing you know like it's like something to be embarrassed about and yeah. like now it's just completely normal a little bit like in the in the mid 90s you know do you have an email address you know the idea of people not having an email now, address right. now would be an absolute anathema. You know, what do you mean you haven't got an email address, you know, yeah. <laughs> type thing. So I think it's just, it's that, you know, early uh, adoption, um, exciting phase. Um, and let's, let's just see where, where it goes. But I think having conversations like this, watching webinars, uh, watching face-to-face uh, -face conference talks, it just gives you lots and lots of ideas because there were people that have done the spade work, have gone in, who've, tested it out of mm -hmm. given lots of prompts um and you do that's that's one piece of advice i would say don't just expect it to just deliver you the a star text that you want straight away you have to tweak it you have to say can you make that simpler or can you yeah. change that question or what have you mm -hmm. you're not going to just you know within five minutes produce a fantastic well maybe you could but i would suggest mm -hmm. you know any language teacher worth their salt they need to differentiate they need to tweak it they need to be um uh very creative about the prompts that they put in and think about them i mean one thing i did from quite early on was i put together a google sheet and i put it out with the uh, mfl twitter rt hashtag and i said i think it'd be really good if people um maybe shared some of the prompts that they've been putting in who are language teachers and there's one uh, person who is uh, cs shoots on twitter i don't know her actual name but cs shoots on twitter and she went a bit chat GPT crazy and she put about 20 prompts in. So if you search for my um, my name plus um, uh, chat GPT in Google Sheet or something, mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll find it. I'm sure we can put it in the show yeah, notes. Yeah, we sure can. But, yeah, send um, me that. Just, just, you know, and I'm, again, I'm not saying just use it as it is, but just use it for inspiration. Think, oh, right. Yeah, you could do this. That's why I love Meredith's yeah. face when Cloudy was saying, oh, yeah, do you know you could do this? And, and she kept saying, you know, shut the front door type thing. And it was just like... <laughs> Wow, I love that. I love that sort of you know genuine reaction. So we're uh, we're at early stages, but um, the future's bright. I mean, are we going to talk more about the negatives as well? Maybe. Yeah, we probably should, um, because there are some downsides to it. I think you know some of the plus sides we've we've talked about. Um, you know, helping teachers, you know, manage their time and and doing a lot of that. The, what, the other thing I was going to say before we move on to some of the downsides um, is the other thing I find is 
one of my favorite things about going to professional development conferences and things is having that and doing the podcast is being able to talk to people. Right. And that's where generation, uh, you know, idea generation happens in my, at least for me and many others. Right. Um, I, I very seldom have a good idea all by myself. I usually, you know, t- talk to somebody else and it's yeah. amplified and we play off of it and we're like, Ooh, what if you did this? Or what if you did that? Right. And not everybody has that person. Like nobody, not everybody has a person next door to them that they're teaching next to that, you know, whether that person just doesn't, you know, work that way, or you literally are a lone person by yourself. You don't always have that. And so I think as far as accessibility and people having somebody to bounce ideas off of, you know, some, and I get, I say somebody, if you're watching, if you're just listening to the podcast, um, uh, and not watching it. We do, I do, I've been doing a lot of air quotes, like conversation and, you know, that sort of thing. Cause it's a weird, we don't have the language yet to talk about this, or at least I don't have the language yet to talk about this entity very well. Um, but having that, you know, access, you know, when you can't go to a conference and having that, that idea generation person thing <laughs> to help you, I think is a really positive thing. So now let's talk about a little bit of some of this, you know, you mentioned scare monitoring. I think some of it is like whenever there's anything new, there's always a, a, a little bit of like, Ooh, this is scary. Where is this going to go? Like, how am I not, are you not going to need teachers anymore? Are you not going to need podcasters? Are you, is, you know, there is some of that. I think that's natural. And I think some of it, you know, is valid. There are a lot of things that these virtual assistants and AI can kind of do um, that can kind of be a little bit of alarming. Um, You know, we always go to cheating, student cheating and things like that. So let's talk about like some of the downsizes, you know, um, and or, you know, some of the, the down, the bad effects that it can have, let's just say. Yeah. So, I mean, the, from an education point of view, I think the obvious thing to say is that students will use it to Uh, create text and then swear blind that they had written the text themselves um, and it wasn't chat gpt that did it Um, i think that's going to be the the uh, the challenge or the problem one could say for um, lots of language teachers who admittedly have been dealing with google translate issues for years and years and years but i think that's that's going to be uh, one big challenge, another challenge, I know I've said this a few times, but the fact that the students have to be 18 or above um, mm-hmm. to use it. So they will be, of course, students at home who are younger than that, who are going to put in their phone numbers and um, create an account. And there's obviously, you know, uh, a, an oversharing issue there and data privacy issue there. Um, so I think as schools um, uh, and as districts, you know, it's imperative to make it make it clear that um of the the age restriction i know for example in certain states like in uh, new york i think they've banned uh, chat gpt on all the uh, the public schools i think likewise in queensland in um, in australia they've also done the same thing um as well and as with anything to do with disruptive technologies there's always some people that will say let's shut it all down and then there's other people who are saying no no let's not do that let's learn from how we can use the tools um, responsibly and safely, and I'm much, much more in the the latter camp. In the you know, learn how the tools work, make it clear to the students the the pitfalls and the dangers. And um, if you feel that a student has done a piece of work that has been generated by ChatGPT, ask them to maybe do something um, on uh, on paper with pen and see if it's of the same standard. Or of course. If you know the, I mean, I think what's difficult is if it's on a basic level, if you ask students to write, I don't know, 10 sentences using the present tense, um, you could easily, you know, to do a certain subject, you could easily get a something like ChatGPT to generate that or even Google Translate. And there'd be no way of knowing. But once it gets more complex, if suddenly uh, a 12 year old student is using the, the subjunctive, <laughs> right. you know full well that you haven't taught that to them, then that's right. going to be a pretty obvious thing. So, um, yeah, teachers gonna, are going to have to be more um, uh, alert or, or just uh, be aware of the fact that students will be using these tools. If they haven't heard of ChatGPT, mm-hmm. then this episode, I'm sure, is going to be a, a big wake-up call. Um, but again, on Facebook groups and, uh, and other places, I've seen people you know, saying, well, is this going to replace teachers? This is going to mean that we won't have a job, et cetera. And I think that 
whenever people say that to do with technology, even though I do think this is a jump forward, mm -hmm. I can't see that happening at all because students want to be in the classroom. They want to be with other human beings. They, they like, you know, the soft skills that the teacher has as well as, um, uh, the the actual you know the subject knowledge I think having the you know the empathy and and what have you um, is incredibly important and I think that uh, to me one of the best ways of describing it as I said earlier is like a sort of a little learning assistant like your personal learning assistant um, but I think yeah that's that's really important and then on a on a out of education level I remember seeing a YouTube clip when uh, this guy was suggesting that well not suggesting showing how you could use chat GPT to create like a phishing email mm -hmm. with a, like a virus link in it, which is like, Oh my, or you think like, yeah. is someone going to, you know, order some plutonium and make a nuclear bomb or what have you. Mm -hmm. But uh, supposedly there are safeguards in chat GPT. Well, not just supposedly there are safeguards in, if you ask it certain questions, it will say, you know, for example, there was, there was an example I saw on a YouTube clip about asking chat GPT to um, hotwire a car and it would say, well, you can't do that. This would be illegal to do that. So, and then the person got around that by saying, imagine I am a person who would like to hotwire a car. So in other words, you're creating this idea of imagination mm. as if you're playing a role, which is another thing you can do. You can sort of write me a, a poem in the style of Shakespeare or Eminem or whatever it might be, and they will do it. Um, it ChatGPT will, will, will I, I said they again, <laughs> ChatGPT will, will, will do it. Um, <laughs> But um, so, yeah, there are scary, scary stories around how you could get around the safeguard issues and get mm -hmm. it to do something which, you know, you shouldn't be doing. And I think that people will become more and more sophisticated on trying to do that. So those are the negative sides. But from the from the point of view of using it uh, for teachers to generate content worksheets exercises i think it's wonderful yeah and i know like literally right on the chat gpt uh, page one of the things it says is it may occasionally generate incorrect information because it is taking yeah. this all from a database that was made by human beings so all of the incorrect data all of the bias content is it's accessing all of that in its memory like you, you know kind of thing so it said it may occasionally produce harmful instructions or biased content Right. And so, again, as language teachers, that's something we want to make sure that that we ad address. I know I did one. Um, I did a, a like a little CI story where it was, you know, about a girl going on a trip to you know Puerto Rico that has a series of misadventures. And but yet she learns a lesson at the end. That's what I put in. Right. Um, and, you know, it produced this little story. Uh, and then I went back and I said, add some cultural details about the country that she visited because it didn't have anything. So just lack of those um, important cultural details. Then I went back and it did add some very culturally appropriate sort of circumstances um, that would happen as well. So but again, you know, you, there's some things we have to be careful of. And and so watching out for that that bias or lack of, you know, um, cultural awareness and interculturality is something um, it also has a very limited memory, so it doesn't really know things after 19 or 2021, I guess. So, you know, it doesn't yeah, add, right. know anything about new, you know, new events or things like that as of now. Now that may change or whatever. But um, I mean, just on that cultural piece, um, a friend of mine, Vincent Everett uh, on Twitter, who's uh, V Everett MFL, um, and he has been uh, playing around with uh, the difference um, with Mexican Spanish and uh, Castilian Spanish and he's found well the impression I've had is that he's he's felt disappointed by the um the answers that chat GPT has given for example the word camion uh, which obviously means lorry in Castilian Spanish I think in Mexican Spanish um is more like um like a coach I think or it has a different meaning anyway mm -hmm. um and he was asking um for it to uh, describe describe words with the Mexican meaning and I don't think mm -hmm. that it was it didn't do as good as job as um, he wanted it to be. So if you're very, very specific about things, then it can uh, it can be problematic. Um, but if you're just using it, as you say, you know, to generate a story, um, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. And, and you can just say, yeah, I want it to be a funny story. I want yeah. it to have a funny ending or, or what have you. I think it's absolutely amazing for that. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's got, yeah it it's is. It, it's got a lot. I've, I've got a... Um, I know. So before, when I first checked it out, ChatGP didn't keep your old conversations. 
And now it does. So you, you know, you'll have a list of them all. But before that, there was a lot of people taking screenshots, or I would copy and paste all of the prompts from something just so I didn't lose this information um, as well. And so I do have a, a Google file of, of some um, circumstances uh, that maybe I'll put one of them in the chat too. But I think the best thing is just for teachers to just hop in there, start using it, see what you can do, how it can, you know, get your creative juices going as far as either lesson planning or providing CI, comprehensible input or text and, or just some of those rote sort of, you know, things that we have to do. Um, you know, there was, um, I'm trying to think there was a, you know, you can say things like generate 20 phrases for, you know, feedback, <laughs> you know, just general in Spanish or something. And then I've got a list of 20 feedback phrases that I can kind of use in, you know, copy and paste into students work if I need to or whatever. Um, you know, there's a lot of just generic things that can save teachers time, I think. And, um, you know, I definitely I, I encourage people to check out the wakelet that you're collecting things. I know I've learned a ton from that just today. And I think we'll keep, well, you know, we're going to keep learning more, but I appreciate you having this really fun you know, early adopter, forward thinking sort of conversation about it. And uh, is there any other tips or anything you want to leave teachers with before um, we go? Well, I would just say um, I'm just I'm literally using it on a day to day basis in different ways. One uh, way in which I found it really useful in relation to when I'm sort of marketing webinars is I do um, I schedule tweets, and instead of um, in the past, when I've done like countdowns, like, you know, 30 days to go before X, Y, and Z webinar, 29 days to go, 28 days to go, I just literally put the summary of the webinar into ChatGPT and I said, write me 20 tweets promoting um, this webinar. Make sure that you put this um, hashtag in, this username or these usernames and the link to where people can register. And within literally... 30 seconds wow. it, it had created it. And sometimes it sort of, it gets a bit tired and it stops after like 11 <laughs> and then you just say, can you give me another 10 please? And then it generates another, and it says, yes, I love the way how it's so positive. Yes, of course I can. <laughs> right. Yeah, no problem. And it does another 10. And then I just literally copy and paste those into say Google doc. And I go into then uh, Twitter on the browser and I just schedule um, all the tweets, which doesn't take too long, but in the past I would do the the countdown and now yeah. I do. And in fact, um, one of the webinars, which um, uh, or series of webinars I've been doing um, recently with um, Esmeralda Salgado, who is Botones Salgado on Twitter, um, they're still available. We've done three so far, three to go, giving students wings. Check it out on my Twitter. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, she said, oh, Joe, I thought you were getting all lyrical and poetic <laughs> with your tweets. And I said, no, it's just chat GPT. And then she just laughed and laughed and laughed. That's so funny. But, um, but yeah, that, I mean something that we haven't talked about is do we give you know as a as a teacher should you give a disclaimer saying that mm. such and such a text was written by chat gpt like if you're yeah. applying for a job for example or you're writing yeah. a resume or you're writing a covering letter would it be unprofessional not to say or how you know yeah. who would say that would it would it you know seem bad that you say oh yeah actually i wrote this this letter using chat gpt um, would you not get the job or would you be seen as unprofessional by doing that? What do you think? That is, that is an interesting thought um, as far as giving credit and, and taking ideas. That's a really, really interesting. Like every time I hear, think of something, and I think there are going to be these questions that come up as far as how we use it and the, and the ethics behind it, you know? Um, so I think these are all really interesting conversations that are going to continue to happen. It's definitely, in my opinion, not going anywhere. Like I said, I'm disappointed in Google now when I use it. I'm disappointed in Siri and Alexa because they don't really understand me like ChatGTP does. They don't have a oh, conversation. Right? <laughs> I know. I, I really sound sad and lonely here don't I, in my house. Not at all. I, I do have interactions with grown people. Don't worry about me. Not well, one, one reason I've, I've tried to appear on 23 plus, this is my 24th podcast to start the pandemic because I love to talk to people yeah. but not chit chat but have actual real conversations yeah. yeah and podcasting is just a fantastic way of doing that being you know it we're is. thousands of miles away from each other but we can have a lovely conversation and we can share that conversation with the world and hopefully there'll <laughs> be one you know light bulb moment for someone listening to this 
wherever they may be. Again, a fantastic thing about, about podcasting, they could be going for a walk, they could be doing some marking, what have you, and they could get that light bulb moment and that could really change their practice forever. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Well, just, to finish, <laughs> just to finish with, you know, the whole um, page on the stage, side on the uh, scribe on the side. Yeah. I was um, um, uh, a friend of mine from University of Limerick um, sent me a, a DM this morning because, of course, DMs weren't working yesterday. When I went to bed last night, they weren't working anyway. She sent me a DM about like a Twitter chat to do with podcasting in higher education. And so, of course, you know, half an hour later, I'd been through and looked at everything. Um, but one thing I really liked in relation to the whole uh, scribe on the side stage on the uh, stage, uh, sage on the stage was peer in the ear oh i, I like that yeah. <laughs> that's great so i'm gonna have to use that for a title i think that's great uh, at least with you know attribution of course but just say yeah uh, peer in the ear podcasting in the languages classroom something like that so uh, there we are in fact that's maybe, maybe that's what we can call the um the episode <laughs> i love that i think that is great i love it so well thank you so much it's been such a pleasure talking with you again and We'll have you back hopefully before another 40 episodes. Um, I'd love to chat with some more. So thank you so much, Joe, and best of luck and good luck with your webinar with Aubrey and Carolyn that's coming up. Thank you so much, Michelle. Absolute pleasure as always. And um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me on uh, to, to be uh, only the second person that's appeared <laughs> twice. I feel really privileged and um, hopefully um, world language educators uh, from the States and people from all over the world will find the information really useful and uh, if they want to get in touch with me i'm just at joe dale on twitter uh, that's probably the the best and easiest way to find me i'm on linkedin as well but probably just on twitter is a really good way and i can't wait to to retweet and to amplify this uh this episode and hopefully we'll get lots of comments yeah. and people will find the content useful it's been great fun michelle thank you it has thank you so much mm -hmm.